Almighty God, we're thankful uh, for your word, for how you've preserved it, how you've sustained us with it, how you work uh, in the world through it and in us. God, tonight as we think about just continuing to study uh, theology and various deep concepts, we pray, God, that it would be fruitful and beneficial. It would increase our faith and um, help us to uh, think more critically about that faith. We pray that it would make an impact on us, that we would be a light um, where we have influence in our community uh, with our family and friends. Um, Lord, also we just lift up uh, these two concerns we've mentioned uh, with Armani's brother, Sean. God, we pray that you would bless that whole situation. You'd be with the doctors. You would uh, be with the medical team, and you would comfort uh, him uh, and all their family. And we pray that if it be your will, you would heal him of this. Um, we also want to pray for Jimmy's co-worker uh, with just this multiple devastating losses. God, that we we struggle to identify with, uh, many of us do, and so we pray that uh, people would come around them and that you would comfort them with your spirit, uh, that you would point uh, them to the gospel, and that you would help all of us um, just to uh, be living lives of repentance and faithfulness, and that we would be drawn closer to you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so... Tonight, um, we are continuing our study in biblical theology, and we've been talking about the doctrine of the Word uh, for the last five weeks. And we've talked about uh, inspiration, uh, inerrancy, uh, the authority of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture. Um, last week, we talked about sufficiency and necessity. And tonight, this is our last... Um, theological type study about the scriptures. Next week uh, we'll finish out the doctrine of the word when we talk about canonicity, which will be very difficult to prep for, I think, but I've been spending some time on that uh, recently, so hopefully that can be beneficial to us. And after that we're going to be talking about the doctrine of God, so we'll get into the character of God, the attributes of God, uh, things like that. But this evening, and we're looking at the transformative power of scripture. And on its face, you read that title, um, it seems pretty simple, but it gets pretty complex when you think about how it is that a written text, you know, a written words on paper, how is it that they have power, right? What does that mean? And so, you know, we've, we've dived into that some for the last five weeks, but we're going to talk a little bit more about the language and the grammar of that tonight and some things that I've never heard of or thought about. So it'll be challenging and interesting, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, so the power of Scripture. Um, theologian Timothy Ward uh, says this. He says, The words of the Bible are a significant aspect of God's action in the world. And that's really what we're focusing on uh, when we think about the power of Scripture, what we're referring to is the fact that the Scriptures um, have an actual effect on the reader, the hearer, um, the world uh, that they go into. And so this transformative power is this understanding that God uses His words, and, and specifically the Scriptures. Um, it, it's not just words on a page, right? It's... It's more than that. God does things in the world. He performs actions with His Word, and um, His Word has intended responses for us. And so God, God has intentions and plans with His Word and how it will affect the world. And so that's, that's where we're going uh, this evening. And uh, our lesson summary, and this is there on your handout, is this, the transformative power of Scripture is the multifaceted effect that God, its author, brings about through His Word. And so multifaceted, that's the key word there because you know we're, we're kind of bringing together all the topics we've discussed over the last five weeks 
and, and how that works uh, with His Word. And so it, it is multifaceted uh, how God does this. And so here's a, a few of these. There's five of these key things we're going to talk about. Uh, the first, which I've dived into some, is that the doctrine of power, um, the doctrine of the power of Scripture, is focused on the effect. And this one, I think, is critical. Um, the power, this power, is not the magical effect of the mere words of Scripture, right? It's, it's not some sort of uh, over-spiritualized magic that comes from written words, but it is the reality that God actually speaks to us through the Bible, right? That, that's what makes the Bible different from all other texts, right? From all other books. It's that God, it's the literal Word of God. And, and that's, that's a complicated statement, but you've got to bring in together all the things we've already studied, right? So what it means for it to be inspired, what it means for it to have authority, all those things work together. Um, scripture's transformative power may act unilaterally, but it often engages... Um, it's readers and hearers in trusting, obeying, and heeding Scripture in other appropriate ways. And so this is another a key point that we'll try to make. It's that, you know, how do we see the effect of Scripture? Um, what do we look for? You know, sometimes, um, if you just think in history, and we'll look at some of these, God speaks and things happen. Right? They just, they just happen by God's power. But the, the effect of Scripture... Scripture transforms us in that, right? It transforms the hearer, you know, the effect it has on us, how, how Scripture changes our life. That's, that's how we see this power. That's where the power is. Uh, two more. Um, because Scripture is inspired and illumined by the Holy Spirit, its transformative effect is particularly associated with Him. So, you know, obviously, um, God works through the Spirit, through the Word to transform us. It's not just our basic reading and our own abilities to understand. It's the Spirit working in us that brings about that effect. And then the last thing we'll talk about is the infallibility of Scripture. So again, we've talked about some of these by themselves. But the infallibility of Scripture means that it never fails to accomplish the purpose intended. So God is using His Word. He's affecting his people, he's affecting his creation with it, causing things to happen. And even though we may not immediately see what the intention is, I mean, it never fails. Right? Scripture never fails to accomplish that which God has set it to do. And so that's a, a brief introduction, I guess. And so let's start with a little bit of discussion. Um, so transformative power. We're talking about the ways that Scripture changes us. So would anybody, um, is anybody willing uh, to share an example from their own life where the Scriptures have changed something about you? So something you thought or something you uh, used to think and now you don't think or whatever. Anybody have an idea of a time when the Bible has actually brought about a change in your life? Anyone? I know we have, but anyone sh care to share an example? I, I can wait all day. I can wait all day. I've got one planned. No one says anything. Nobody. All right. Hang on with Derek. All right. Let me go ahead. Let me go. I already knew. I had my note here. Go ahead. If no one said anything. Oh, I, I, can, I can chill in the silence. Uh, I mean, for, for me, the most clear example is I can, that I can remember is early on in my Christian experience, um, I can remember really struggling assurance. Sure. How do I how do I know that I've you know done enough to be right. saved? How do I know I've done all the right things and checked off the right boxes and um I was reading uh, out of first John 
the text in 1 John where it says that it's not us who love God, but God who loved us. And just the Lord really took that truth and planted it down deep in my heart and gave me just almost immediate assurance in that moment. And it, it really helped me understand that it's, it's not about what I've done, it's about what Christ has done. Right. And uh, I would say definitely a change of thinking I've heard in that moment. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and that's a good example, you know, because you're referring to First John. You know, it's not, it's not that we love God, but that God first loved us. That's a weak paraphrase. Um, but so that, um, that scripture uh, brought about a transformation in your thinking, right? And so, one thing we're going to talk about is. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I didn't think anybody would say one, so now I have to now I have to deal with somebody saying one. And I don't have it in my notes. But so we're gonna talk about in a few minutes um something called speech act theory. Raise your hand if you've heard of speech act theory. No one, right? I hadn't either until I was looking at the source book I'm using for this class and so I trying to figure out what that is but we're, we'll talk more about this but it's basically a way to understand language uh, spoken word and it's not really a, it's not a doctrine it's just it's, it, it makes sense and we'll talk more about it but the idea is that everything we say is actually an action too right we we mean things uh, and the same is true for God so when God speaks, He's not simply saying words for no purpose, right? But there is a there is a action that God is doing in His speaking. That so that text, you know, um, in First John, we see this promise of God penned through the apostle, and it's intended to bring about a effect on the reader, right? And the effect is what trusting in that promise, right? That that's true, and so we might disobey that text in various ways, but one way we might fail to obey that text is disbelief, right? We, we don't respond in trust. We think that, no, it's actually about my own love for God that's primary you know, or, or something. Um, and we'll break that down more as we go. Um, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But one one text that just came to my mind that, um, would be a good example of this. And so this is Ephesians 5. Uh, we see this text here um, talking about how a husband should love their wife. All right, so it says, Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Um, he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. So thinking about this idea of someone being transformed by the Scripture, you know, God's Word bringing about an effect on them. So say someone, a new believer, reads this text for the first time. What are some, what would it look like for them to be transformed by this passage? Anybody got an idea? The hypothetical uh, newly married man. Um, what what things might change in somebody's life as a result of this text? What would it look like for someone to obey this text? Imagine a um, guy who's been single his whole life, only had to care about himself, uh, spends all his money and time on things that please him, and then he, in the providence of God, finds a wife, finds himself married, okay? What what might change in his mind? Hypothetically, right? Responsibility. Sure. So so there's a brand new responsibility, right? Um, this this young man finds himself no longer only responsible for himself, right? He's now responsible for a wife as well. Um, what else?
What else? What's it look like for a man to love um, his wife as he loves himself? Everybody's quiet. Yeah. 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 So he, he's going to care for her needs at least as much as his, right? Um you know he's he's gonna. I mean, what kind of things? How does a man nourish and cherish himself? You know, he he provides for himself. He he cares for his mental health, right, and his physical health, and his spiritual health, um, and all these things. But but you get the point. Um, this text has a command from the Lord of how husbands should love their wife, and it's there's intention behind that, right? That they would obey it, right? And then the result is uh, they love their wife like Christ loved the church. And so we're going to get into some of this a little bit more, but the point is this. The Scriptures um, are intended to transform us, right? To to make changes in our lives um, and bring us into conformity with Christ. And in this, um, God acts through His Word. Um, he, he's fulfilling His purposes through His Word. And so, we're going to look at a couple of these um, major affirmations here. And, and they'll bring us around. And I'll try to help it make as much sense as I can. Um, I've struggled with this topic somewhat. But the first one is this, is the close relationship between God and His Word. And so we'll kind of do a helicopter view on this, but I want to talk about this theory I was mentioning to you earlier. And so, the scripture is more than just written words, right? It is, it is God doing things and working in the world through His Word, and that is um, where we get to this speech act theory. So, it's not just speech; it's speech in action. It's God causing an effect. So, God engages in speech acts that produce an effect in this world. And so I'll give us a second explanation of this. And so here's the idea uh, behind speech act theory. Um, it's that all speech is a kind of action. And so there's a, this actually came from an Ivy League guy, so we should probably immediately reject it. Um, but his name is J.L. Austin. Uh, he came up with this theory and He's got some odd terms and stuff, but I think it will help us. And, and basically what he's saying is when we observe any speech, you know, all words, things that people say, um, oftentimes they consist of three different parts. So these things we say have actions, and here's the three parts. Um, so the first is locution. No one's heard of that, I'm sure. But locution is, at its face, it's just the basic statement that is said. Okay, and I'll give us some examples. So, locution is the statement. Now, it's what's communicated. Illocution is the force behind it. So, uh, when God gives us the Ten Commandments, okay, he, He's giving us commands to obey. That's the effect. That's the illocution um, they are uh, commands. Or it could also be a promise, you know, like the text Jimmy mentioned earlier uh, is, is more of a promise. It's a doctrinal understanding. Um, and then uh, the third term is perlocution, which is the intended response of the hearer. So the idea is this, you know, we can, we might disobey something in the Word by failing to um, respond the way God calls us to, or, or even uh, rejecting the illocution, which is the effect behind it, what He's wanting us to do. We might misunderstand it and find ourselves on the wrong side um, of that command. So, so here's an example. So, um, it's raining outside. Okay, if I, if I say it's raining outside, that's my locution. Well, the intended 
effect is that I'm, I'm making a clear statement to you that rain is literally falling on the ground, right? There's water coming out of the clouds. But my intended effect, the perlocution, is you'll know and you'll take an umbrella, right? We, we, would, we would understand this teaching by responding in obedience like that. You know, uh, the example they gave in the book I'm using, uh, Greg Allison's, theology book here is uh, the pronouncement of a marriage so I now pronounce you husband and wife um, that's a declaration that someone makes uh, but the elocution there is they're now legally married that's the effect that that pronouncement makes them legally married as long as they followed the the laws got their license and all those things um, and then the perlocution is now they're officially married that's the result and so the the point is this if this is accurate in language um, we can understand it also through the scripture and it, and it kind of brings out uh, it helps us see some ways to apply the text of scripture when we see it in this way and so we'll come back to that but again we're talking about this close relationship between god and his word so what do you think uh, in the bible What's the first time that God performs an action with His words? What do you guys think? Can anybody think of the first time in Scripture God performs something with His words? Genesis, Genesis 1, right? Uh, in the creation account, right? So um, he, he speaks, you know, Genesis 1, 3, Let there be light, and there was light. All right, so this, this is a clear example um, of God doing an action with His Word um, and, and causing things, the effect of His Word. Um, Psalm 33, 6 says this, says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth um, all their host. Um, Hebrews 11, 3 uh, affirms that it says by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not well say was no made, was not made out of things that are visible. And if we went to Genesis one, we'd see that God said, um, "Is is there at least eleven times, uh, ten times in Genesis one, further on after that?" And so God uses speech acts. He uses his words to make an effect. Um, he also does that after the fall. Um, if, we, if we were to go to Genesis, and um, we'd see God pronouncing curses on the serpent, curses on the man, the woman, the ground. He just says things, and there's an effect of that. Um, if we went on in Genesis a little further, and we get to the account of Abram, um, he, he gives these promises, these commands to Abram, and then he follows it. So we, we have speech act here. It says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will have a blessing. And, all, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And if we went on uh, to verse 4, we see that he obeyed. All right, so God gives him this command. Um, and Abram acts on it. Um, how about some New Testament uh, examples? Philippians 4, 6. And so here's, do not be anxious about anything. So thinking about this speech act idea, and we have a command, and what is our intended response from this command here? How, how do we obey this? <coughs> What do y'all think? Give your worries to God. Yeah. We, we give our worries to God. We respond with uh, not worrying about maybe some specific situation, right, that, that we're super anxious about, right? Or there, There's an intended response to this. And so if I, if I read this text and then I continue... To be a worry wart, I'm not obeying this passage, right? I'm, I'm rejecting 
this command. Uh, but when we break it down in this way, we can see um, how we might apply and understand some of these passages. Here's another one. So this is uh, Jesus speaking here to his apostles. And he says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself. And so Jesus is providing comfort uh, to his disciples here in John 14. And so what do you think about this? What, what do you think is the intention behind this statement? H- how did Jesus intend that the disciples would respond to this? What's he doing? Yeah, so he's he's giving them comfort, right? And and the intended response for them is that they would trust him, right? They 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 would trust his promise here, and uh, instead of wallowing in their distress, right, they would trust Jesus. Um, that's what they would do. Uh, that was the intention. And so this first. Um, this first affirmation here is about God's deep connection with His Word. And what we mean by that is the fact that God is doing these actions. He's working in us. He's working in His church. He's working through His people and bringing a transformation through His Word. And so this next affirmation, um, and so we're just bringing all this around here, is just this idea of transformative power. Um, And so... We affirm this, uh, that, that God's Word has power to change us. Um, and we see this in a lot of ways. Um, here's a couple of just basic ways where the Word is powerful all in itself. You, know, you think of Hebrews 4.12, uh, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, so the Word is living and it cuts us deep, right? It has power to, to read us and understand us all in itself. Um, it reveals our intentions. Um, it reveals our thoughts um, and all those things. We see uh, in Jeremiah 23, look at how the prophet here describes the word. He says, Is, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer, that breaks the rock in pieces. And so we we see God describing his word with strength, right? With ability, with power all in itself. And so when we when we think of the scriptures um, and we think of this transformative power and it's bringing an effect, I think it helps us uh, to make application you know, because I mentioned this in the beginning, but sometimes God's Word just acts unilaterally. I mean, God just does things with His Word. Uh, here's one more example of that. Um, you think of John 18, verse 6, and if you remember this, they're arresting uh, Jesus. They have came and found Him. And Jesus, they, they said, we're looking for this man. And he says, I am He, and they fall to the ground. I don't know if you remember that account, but just one of the I am statements where Jesus quotes the divine name to them and they didn't fall down in worship, right? These were these Roman soldiers that were coming to arrest him. You you have just his word and his quotation of the divine name, something amazing happens, right? And they're literally they collapse backwards um, from him saying this divine name. Uh, so that's an example of its power by itself. We also mentioned creation. Um, But when we think about uh, transformative power, this is really the point we're trying to get to, is that um, transformative power is that it brings about an effect and response from those who read it. So we see the power of Scripture in the ways that Scripture changes us. And God is pleased to work in that way. Um, and so it's specific to Scripture, though, because all literature can bring about a response. You know, in, anything that we look at can cause some sort of effect, but they're not going to cause a Godward 
response, right? It's, it's Scripture alone that brings forward a spiritual response and, you know, other literatures that are based in Scripture. You know, if, if someone is writing something about the Word, obviously that can bring forth a Godward response, but that would be included there. And so let's look at a couple of texts. So this is a, a big one here on the screen, probably hard to read, but I'll read some parts of it. But this is Psalm, uh, Psalm 19. And so we just see here specific transformative effects of Scripture in the Bible. And so if you look there at verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, uh, reviving the soul. Um, and so if you scroll down through there, you have several descriptions of the word. Making wise the simple, and the testimony of the Lord is pure. Uh, the precepts of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. They enlighten the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Um, get down there to verse 11. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. Uh, in keeping them, there is great reward. So here, just in the word itself, it has reviving power. It brings joy to our soul. It makes our minds wise. It gives us joy in the heart. It opens our eyes to see clearly. Um, it warns us about what disobedience can do. Um, Psalm 107, this is another text that talks about the power of the Word itself. It says, Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He sent out His Word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. So we see God using His Word, sending His Word out uh, to His people, and it brings about these effects. Um, another one here, uh, just quickly. I want to get to some of these applications, though. Um, but 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 through 17, we see that the Word is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, uh, that the man of God would be completed or complete, equipped for every good work. So, so just a scanning here of the Scriptures. Um, we see transformative effects of giving wisdom, rejoicing the heart, uh, delivering us from trouble, teaching us, correcting us, training us, and equipping us to serve God. And so all these are not um, things that we just read words and suddenly there's this magic that happens. But God is actually using His Word to work through us, right? He's, he's working in us with His Word because of His connection to it. Um, this third affirmation, um, again, so this brings this together, um, but the intimate connection between the Word and the Holy Spirit. So, you know, closely associated with this idea of transformative power is the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we, we've talked about this in the last few weeks, but what does that look like? Um, just from a basic understanding, what does it mean uh, that the Spirit um, is closely connected with transforming power? What's that mean? Anybody got a thought? How does the Spirit do this? What does the Spirit do? How are they connected? What do you think, Phil? How's the Spirit? What's the Spirit got to do with any of it? And then the word that you're hearing is inspired by the Spirit. Right? So yeah. The Spirit's yeah. going to say its own word. From the very beginning, right? It's the the Holy Spirit is what, what moved along in the writers, right? We talked about inspiration. So it's the Spirit's closely connected to that. And so we, would, we wouldn't have the written Scriptures right, without the work of the Spirit. Um, and then what happens? So then we have the Scriptures. We have these inspired Scriptures. What else does the Spirit do to transform us in the Word? How else do we need Him? We, we need the Spirit to bring it to light, right? We, we cannot understand the words of Scripture. You know, we talked about, um, I think, what, what lesson that was. You know, 
we talked about how all that's needed to have a basic understanding is ears and eyes, right? But to actually have fellowship with the Scripture and, and, it, and the meaning of it come to life, we need the Spirit, right? The Spirit illumines that uh, in our life. So the Spirit um, helped author the Scriptures. Um, the Spirit illumines our hearts. Um, if we went further on, um, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that regenerates the soul, right? So we, we wouldn't even know the Lord apart from the work of the Spirit. It's, it's the Spirit that brings that life. So the Spirit is connected deeply in all this. Um, just a couple of basic texts with that in mind. Uh, Romans 10.17 Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. And so someone has to hear the good news, hear the Word um, for that faith to come. But if you pair that with 1 Corinthians 12, 3, you know, Paul says here, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. All right, so for us to even exercise that faith, that comes through the Word and, and understand the Scriptures to have any effect in our life, we've got to have the Spirit working, right? The Spirit's going to have to bring that to light. And, and we'll talk a lot more about that uh, in a few months when we think about things like the doctrine of salvation, you know, soteriology, things like that. But when we think about how the Scriptures work, um, what's, the, what's the intentions behind it, how does it work in us, we see that this faith, even that, is, is from the Spirit. We need the Spirit to do that. Um, a couple more examples. Um, you know, what's another way we would say this? Is that regeneration, right? We, um, the Spirit brings us to faith, and that is regeneration. And so this is First Peter 1, 23 and 25. says, since you have been born again, that's the same idea that, new birth, that's regeneration. That's just a different way that we might say it. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. So we hear the written Word of God. Um, the Holy Spirit regenerates the heart, gives us the new birth. Um, and that's, that's all done together, right? The Spirit does it. And the Word does it, um, hand in hand. Um, Titus 3, 5 says it this way. It says, He saved us not because of works done in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So again, we're, we're thinking about how the Scripture has power to change us. You know, all these things kind of fall together. You know, God has intentions with His Word to bring about an effect, but that effect cannot happen apart from the Holy Spirit working in it, right? So the, they're all... And we could look at tons of texts. We could look at 1 Corinthians 6, um, 2 Thessalonians 2. We could go further in 1 Peter. Um, and we would see in the 1 Peter chapter 1 that it's also our sanctification that's worked by the Spirit. So all, all these things uh, combine together to make the Scriptures transform us. Uh, and this last affirmation is the infallibility of Scripture. And we won't talk about this much, but it's just this idea that uh, much of these doctrines that we've already covered are coming together to show us how the Word functions in the Christian's life. And so when we talk about infallibility, um, that's just the reminder that the Scriptures, um, the Scriptures will never fail to accomplish God's intended purposes, right? They, they cannot. Um, we may not immediately see a response we think should be there, but regardless, the, the Scriptures will always accomplish what God intends for them to do. And so why is that? Well, because they're divinely inspired, right? And, and they have authority, and they're sufficient and necessary, and, and all these things We've talked about they're inerrant, right? So they're without error. They have no mistakes in them. And so when we think about that, and, and you know, think about the language things we're thinking about. Um, 
even if someone response is wrong, that doesn't change the effectiveness of the statement. So if, if someone responds in disbelief, it doesn't change God's intention. Um, so the immediate effect may not be seen, but the scriptures will never fail to do that. And so this is Isaiah fifty five eleven says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I send it. All right, so without failure, um, even if we don't see uh, the intended effect, um, it's not easily detectable. Scripture always achieves the will of God. So quick in summary, we'll look at a few application questions and be finished. But God's the author of Scripture and he has planned to work in the world through it, right? He's not just zapping everything and changing everything. He, his intention is that His people would be in His Word. He would illumine them, their minds by the Spirit, and we would be affected by it. And whatever God's intentions with it are, they will certainly come to pass. So let's look at a few errors uh, to avoid. So, three of these, just, these are pretty basic, but rejecting the inspiration of Scripture leading to a denial of divine power operating through it. So that's, that second part, that, that's our doctrine today, that this idea that God divinely works to bring about an effect through His Word. And so, how does rejecting inspiration failed here. So what are, what are the things that a critic might say um, if they believed in this error? So if someone rejects the inspiration of Scripture, how might they criticize uh, this doctrine? What do you guys think? What would a critic of God's Word say if they rejected inspiration? What do y'all think? Yeah, it's, it's fun to learn, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, any impact. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so any true effect from their mind would just be consequential. Yeah, it's just a, yeah. Um, you know, because... This viewpoint, you know, this idea would be contradicting what Scripture has said. We've talked about this. Uh, scripture affirms inspiration. And so if, if, if we believe this doctrine, then what kind of attitude will we have to the Scripture? Well, if we believe in the transformative power of Scripture, if we believe in inspiration, then we should care about God's Word. Right? We, we should expect God's Word to have an effect on us. We should expect it. Uh, two changes. So, but if we reject inspiration, uh, then it's nonsensical that the scripture would have any real power or true impact. And this one is denying the authority and sufficiency of scripture, uh, resulting in the elevation of other speech acts that are thought to affect transformation. And so, again, just the idea of other words. <laughs> other things that have been said elevating to a level um, of Scripture's own authority. Um, how, how do people do this today? How do people elevate other things to the level of authority that Scripture has? Anybody got any examples of that in their mind? doubt in our, our emotions, right? Our feelings, uh, personal experience, right? Becomes a, a superior word. You know, we talked about over the last couple of weeks a lot about uh, Roman Catholicism and capital T tradition and all those things, you know, and um, yeah, the, all those are examples. Um, some other prophetic word, right? We we have tons of prophets today that we see on TV and we read on the internet. 
Um, so there's there's tons of ways we can do this, or even these. Uh, you know, I I can't get into too much, but we've got all kinds of gurus, you know, that that might be Christiany, and have all these great ways to change our lives and help us. And if we would just do these practices and things like that, and um, all those can quickly become tons of idols. And and yeah, the, the the issue is really, you know, when when we listen to anybody with any authority, um, does their speech um, correspond with God's will, right? So it, is it connected and accurate with God's revelation? Um, that's what matters. Um, this third one, um, failing to respond correctly to the locution and illocution of God's speech acts in Scripture. I'm sure everybody remembers uh, what that means. Uh, but the point would just be this. Um, when we look at the commands of Scripture, what is God, what, what's the intention? How are we supposed to respond? You know, and, and sometimes... Uh, we can misunderstand a text and kind of miss the point. How do I even apply this passage? Um, and so it's coming back to that speech act theory thing. But but basically, if God has a command in Scripture um, and we don't respond in obedience, or we do respond in disobedience, you know, we we can do we can do both, right? If uh, if God has given us promises in His Word, and then I respond with a lack of trust, right? I, I refuse to believe those promises, or I act as if they're not true. Um, I can find myself in sin and need it, and needing to repent without even realizing it. You know, I, um, because the light that we have, we might be rejecting some of these things. Um, so it's, you know, it's possible that sometimes we just misunderstand what the text might be saying to us. Um, but we should always look deep and and see how we can apply and obey uh, passages and promises and commands. And so lastly, we'll be done um, with just a couple of applications. Um, so this first one is interesting. I mean, I took this right out of uh, Greg Allison's book, but it says, Approaching the Scriptures um, as our adversary that challenges us and he means it in the positive sense, right? You know, what's the what's the true meaning of of an adversary? The term, you know, that would be a challenger, right? Um, and so, when we look at it from this way, you know, we we're the ones that are likely to uh, disobey, right? We're the ones that have sin natures that we're battling, you know. And so, in that sense, um, we need to realize that the word is always engaging us and challenging us. Um, God's given us commands in Scripture, um, and there's no such thing as a neutral response. You know, we, we, we respond in faithfulness or we respond in sin. And, but there, there's no neutrality uh, with His Word. And so the Bible's always challenging us to be transformed. Um, and so we just have to be, we have to be aware uh, of that. And we need to always be applying that to our intentions and our thoughts. Um, and you can make a ton of applications of that. Um, I've got a couple, but for sake of time, we'll move ahead. Um, this last one is this. Um, we should be expecting the Scripture to transform us. And that's really the point. We, we should approach the Scripture... Um, with an eager expectation that it's going to have an effect on us because of its transformative power. Uh, well, with that, um, I'll pray uh, and we can be dismissed. Next week, uh, we're going to be talking about the canonicity of Scripture, which is probably going to be complicated and fun. But I'll pray for us and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that you've preserved it for us, that you you divinely work through it to transform us, to bring about an effect uh, in us. God, help us to read your word uh, expecting that. Uh, God, help us to read it expecting to be challenged, uh, looking for ways to conform to it and make us ready and willing uh, to obey you. 
And we pray that you would forgive us where we all fall short and you would point us to Christ um, and that we would be dedicated to him and that we would go out from here more conformed to his image. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.